everyone. Today I am so excited to be talking to author Liz Trenow and her newest book is called The Hidden Thread and thank you so much for talking with me today Liz. It's a lovely to be here. I, I'm, I'm so happy that I get to talk to authors you know the Skype makes it so possible that I get to talk to you guys from from very far away and uh and it, it makes it, I just talked to somebody who was in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. So, you know, <laughs> I wish I was <laughs> Me too. I wish I was too. So anyway, I loved your new book. Loved, loved, loved it. I mean, I, like I was talking to you about before we started taping, I love fabric. I love silk. I, you know, I am, um, I don't know. I was never a seamstress. I wouldn't say that, but I do love yarn and silk and all kinds of material. And I grew up in a family that my, my aunt owned a fabric store uh -huh. and then she owned a textile weaving because she started to make the material then. So uh -huh. I felt like when I was reading your book, like we, like we understood each other <laughs> in some weird way. <laughs> But, and my, and my, my family, my grandmother was a seamstress that traveled all over the world, um, fitting people. And, um, so anyway, it was, it was really cool to read about that, but this takes us back. This, this book takes us back. Not, this is not current day. So, um, this is about Anna Butterfield and I wondered how you came across her story. Well, it goes back to when I was researching my own family history. My family have been silk weavers for over 300 years. Um, I grew up next to the silk mill, which is still weaving today in a little town called Sudbury in Suffolk. And it's one of only two or three uh, silk mills still weaving today in the UK. Um, and because it is the oldest family, continuously family owned silk company, I decided I wanted to write the history of it. So I started researching it. Um, I got back to 1666 when the first Walters, we can find the first Walters. Um, we were not Huguenots, uh, as many people assume, i.e. Um, Protestant refugees from France in the, in the 17th and 18th centuries came over to the UK. In fact, we were weaving domestically, locally in England, before they arrived. Um, so my family go by, right back to then, but they were weaving in an area called Spitalfields in East London, just outside the city walls, which is a lot of place where a lot of migrant migrants have been, so starting with the Huguenots, but then also um, Jewish people escaping the pogroms in Russia, followed by Jewish people again in the, in the second half of the 20th century, and Bangladeshis now, and, and some Eastern Europeans now, so it's always been a place of migration. And I discovered the, the first known address of my family as silk weavers, a, a street in Spitalfields called um, Wilkes Street, and I found out the first the, the number of the of the house, and I went and knocked on the door. Now this place is right in central London, just around the corner from some enormous banks and, and and big businesses. I didn't expect anybody to welcome me in, which is what the lady did, and she showed me around this beautiful house. And because it is what we call grade one listed, in other words, it's been kept very much in its historic state, I felt as though my family had just walked out the door. It was spine tingling. It was so exciting, 300 years later, to visit the place where they started weaving silk. As I came out of that door, kind of walking on air as a result of that experience, I saw a blue plaque on the wall of a house just 20 yards away. A blue plaque in London means that this is a place where somebody important lived. And it's really a tourist thing, really a historic thing, marking places where, where, where these interesting or um, important people have lived. And it said, Anna Maria Garthwaite, silk designer, lived here. I knew nothing about Anna Maria Garthwaite, but I immediately wanted to know more, because she lived there just at the very same time as my family lived a few yards up the street. So I started researching her and discovered that she was an extremely highly respected, well-known silk designer in the, in the early part of the 18th century in Spitalfields. Over 900 of her silks are in London's Victoria Albert Museum, and they're completely beautiful. I recommend you look her up. 
they said, absolutely delicious designs. All floral, but all very beautiful. And, but the curious thing about her is that she was a middle-aged woman. She arrived in London as a middle-aged woman, an unmarried woman, with no background, as far as anybody can tell, in silk weaving. Now, all the silk weavers, all the silk designers up until then, many of them had been Huguenots, um, were weavers in the first instance, because designing for silk is a very technical, complex business. And she, the, only other, the only other evidence of her artistic talent that anybody has these days is a paper cut design that she did when she was 17. So between 17 and something like 35 years old, there's no evidence of how she learned to become a designer for silk. So I thought, well, I'm a writer of fiction. I can make this up, <laughs> which right. is exactly what I did. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, I, you know, and I'm looking, you have a timeline at the end of this book, which I am so thrilled about because it, it puts it all together, you know? And I love when authors do that when they're writing historical fiction so that we can see exactly what happened in her life, you know, and see the timeline of it. And... um. I was wondering, so is the character, um, I don't want to say his name wrong because I don't know, I don't know how to speak French. I mean, it looks like Henry, but it's like Henri or Henri or something like that. Oh, it's it's Henri, Henri, okay. but uh, we call him Henri, yes, that's easy enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what, what about his character? What did you find out, of, you know, was it somebody that um, you came across that you made him up as or what, you know, what was... What was going on with him? Well, it cried out to be a love story. I mean, I completely made up Anna. It's, you know, the story of Anna in my book has nothing to do with Anna Maria Garthwaite, except right. that she becomes a silk designer. Okay. And, and, I, and I, I just thought, well, how would she have done that? She'd have got to know a very fine weaver. Mm -hmm. The original name for this book, although it's called The Silk Weaver in the UK, it's called The Hidden Thread in the US, um, but my original name was The Masterpiece, because Ori was um, original. Ori is a Huguenot, and I wanted to tell the story of the Huguenot migrants, as you can tell from having read the book. Yes. Their, 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 their experience of journeying to the UK and other places was so compelling, because it is sadly exactly what um, economic and religious refugees are doing today. They're crossing um, stretches of water in tiny boats. They're spending their life savings. There are people smugglers. I mean, it's exactly what is happening today. And I wanted to tell his story because I felt it is so relevant to today. Also, um, Spitalfields was a real melting pot at that time. It was hugely vibrant. Business was booming, but at the same time, so many French refugees, these Protestant Huguenots, had arrived that 25% of, of people in that area spoke only French. Now, you know how we open our hearts to migrants, but at the same time, if there's that many of them, they feel a bit scary. Um, and I can, and although they were officially welcomed because they were Protestants and they were Protestant King and Queen on the throne of England, um, the, there is quite a lot of evidence that local people resented them. They were very hardworking, they were very clever, they were extremely skilled. In fact, politicians in France reflected later that they lost huge amounts of trade with the exodus of skilled Huguenot craftspeople, including silk weavers. Um, at the same time, it was a, there was a, so there was racial uh, unrest, but there was also political unrest, because industrial unrest rather, because. Um, around that time, the government, in its wisdom, relaxed the free trade laws, and thus a lot of uh, foreign silks were being imported, and the British silk industry really took a massive hit. Um, prices were forced down, and weavers were put right out of work. And there were many people, many weavers starving, and they, and they revolted. They marched on um, Parliament, they broke into the homes of silk masters and slashed their looms. They even slashed the dresses of women wearing imported silk. So, you know, it was a, a pretty violent period and people were hung for, for their misdemeanors. Um, and I just thought what an interesting place to set this novel, but also I needed to have a representative Huguenot family. 
a Huguenot weaver, a Huguenot master, and a Huguenot apprentice stroke journeyman. So, just to explain, um, to become a silk weaver in those days, you did a seven-year apprenticeship from the ages of seven to fourteen, after which you became a journeyman, after the French journée, which means day, you could be paid by a day rate for your weaving. And after you'd done that for a while, you wove what was called a, your masterpiece, which demonstrated your skills as a, as a weaver, and then you could apply to the guild, which is now called the Worshipful Company of Weavers, great name, um, you could apply to the guild to become a master weaver, and a master weaver then could employ apprentices and journeymen of his own. So that, I wanted to tell that story too, the progression of, from apprentice up to master, and how, how, it, how it happened to Ori, and that's why really I, I, I divided the book really into two characters uh, telling their stories in alternate chapters. Yeah, and I love learning about, because a lot of times people don't, re you know, like, well, I should say I didn't realize that England was in the silk weaving business, okay? Because I had always imagined the silk came from the Middle East, you know, and, and you go into your book um, because he asks that question, and you go into it about how that actually happened, you know, and how they get the silk, and then how they weave the silk in England, and I, I really enjoyed that part of it, you know, is learning about the business of silk. Yes, well, um, England has never produced its own silk yarn because, right. um, because it doesn't have the right climate. Well, that's not entirely true. They're, they're famously, the James I, King James I, was so taken by the silk weaving that he saw in Italy that he ordered um, hundreds of mulberry trees to be planted. And, and, and the sort of, you know, the popular mythology is that he planted the wrong kind of mulberry tree. But the truth is, so we never really produced in, in the UK much in the way of silk yarn, although, and the, but the truth is it's simply just our climate. It's not warm enough and it's not damp enough. For enough mulberry trees to grow, all for the um, little worms, the silk worms, to grow and reproduce as quickly as they need to, to produce the sort of yarn we needed. So we've always imported yarn, really, from way back. But we have been weavers of it for a long, long time. Many, many, many centuries. Right. And so you know what I did? Because you go into when Anna moves into London, okay? And she has to now go to a seamstress and get fitted for um, for the clothes that she was she didn't have any of the fancy clothes that they had worn in the city. So I looked up videos uh, because I wanted to see a picture of it. You know when you were describing how she dressed, uh, mm -hmm. and then so I looked it up and I mean I can't imagine. You know like I cannot imagine how they put those layers upon layers upon you know and. And the order, I mean, you can find anyone who's in, interested in looking, you can look on YouTube and they show you what they wore and how they did it and how you really did need a dresser. It wasn't something you were going to be able to do by yourself necessarily. No, definitely not, especially since your stays, which are the undergarments that hold you all in, were, were laced up at the back, so you could never have done it on your own. Um, <laughs> I actually, I was really fortunate because uh, at the time I was researching this book, um, the uh, museums and lots of other places were celebrating, I think it must have been 300 years since the accession of one of the Georges, King Georges to the throne. They are having Georgian seasons, so there are lots of television programs, but also the royal palaces in London were having Georgian um, dis uh, exhibitions and so on. And in Kensington Palace, they had um, enactors, reenactors, you know, people... Um, the actors acting the part of the sort of people who might have been in Kensington Palace 300 years ago. And um, I was talking to one young lady and I said, would you mind me asking you if um, how you get dressed in the morning? And she said, well, yes, of course, come behind this screen, madam. And if you don't mind, I will show you how it happens. And so we, all this is all, she's all in character, of course. <laughs> And um, and uh, so she undresses right down to her night, you know, to her undergarments, and then dresses herself again. So I can actually see it for real life, and and, and and you know, help her tie the stays and help her tie the ribbons and all of that. So I actually experienced it. And the other thing that happened that day was I met a, 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 a rather posh servant character, and I asked him about his wig. Now, if anybody's ever investigated 18th century wigs, it's a total minefield. <laughs> Because they all wore different wigs for different purposes sometimes. They were powdered sometimes. They were not. There were different designs. 
fashions change, you know, almost as often as they do today, both in women's clothing but also in men's clothing and wigs. Um, so there were all these sorts of things that I needed to get right because otherwise I'd get clubbed by some 18th century specialist <laughs> telling me I got it wrong. <laughs> Right. Well, I love the way you described it. I was so happy you did because I did. I mean, I love Victorian anything. And I did always wonder like exactly how those layers worked, you know, and, and, and then to be, you know, when I think about it, like the cost, um, it, is there any way you can like tell us how much a dress then like just one outfit. First of all, she was talking about how she would wear two outfits. She had her day outfit and then she had her night outfit for she would dress rather formally for dinner, even in the family home. So like what is what is like a relevant amount of money in this day and age of what it would have cost for something like that? I just want, this is a small point, you mentioned Victorian, we're not talking Victorian here, we're talking what we call Georgian, oh, which, okay. is, Sorry. which is really, you know, kind of um, 75 years before, really. And we're not even talking Jane Austen either. Um, we're talking early 18th century, well, mid 18th century, whereas Jane Austen is late 18th century, in other words, just slipping into 1900s. Okay. So it's Thank Georgia, you. which Thank is a period you for of correcting me on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite different, really. Um, okay. at, the at that time, clothes would make up a significant part of someone's um, expending, expenditure. Um, and, and I think it's extremely hard to imagine what, uh, what, you know, to translate it, because you might be talking about the, the silk itself could be very, very varied in its quality and its quantity and its weave and so on. So, you know, you, you, you're probably talking in our money today at least two hundred pounds or three hundred pounds or four hundred pounds a dress. Unless you were talking about something much simpler. I mean ordinary people wore cotton. Um or linen. Okay. And they wore it much and they wore much simpler clothing. So that would have been a lot cheaper. Right. Um, but but a lot of people wore second hand clothing. Um, people mentioned clothing in their wills because it was so wow. relatively valuable in, in comparison with the rest of their belongings, if you like. They would mention bed you know, bedsteads and candlesticks and also clothing, which they would pass on to their, you know, to their family when they died. <laughs> wow. Okay, well, let me tell everybody, like, about your other books, because it is amazing to me how quick you are writing your books. I mean, this book came out back in May of 2017 um, in the UK. I'm not sure when... It was weird. Amazon was a very strange for me when I looked it up, so... I will put the link, but it didn't look like I could, I don't know, the link you sent me was good, but for some reason I couldn't get the right link to get the book, and I'm not sure why. Okay. But I will put, you know, I just want everybody, I'm going to put your author page, which takes you to all of your books. So um, so that was this year, and then in 2016 you had The Forgotten Seamstress, and then... <laughs> I think it was a tad bit, yeah, it was, I think, oh, perhaps in the US it came out in 2016, yes, okay. I, 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 I haven't got them all written down, so I can't remember, but anyway, if you say so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so confusing when I talk to you guys over there, because they do have different release dates, and I'm, I'm not sure why, because I'm not a, you know, I'm not a publisher, but... <laughs> because they're different publishers. Oh, okay. And then it's you had, two, so right, you had two other books, The Poppy Factory and The Last Telegram. And they all came in, you know, like a, a year a book, basically, is what you're doing. And I find that amazing for the books that you're writing, that you're able to, you know, to do a book a year. Because, you know, they're so awesome. You know, they're so awesome and so much research and so much, you know, to go into for you. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a stretch, I have to say, to do historical novels in a year. The, the, the last telegram came out of my research and talking to my dad when I, before he died, um, about the history of the company and, 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 and the extraordinary century that he lived through, um, which included two world wars, um, and, and in particular the Second World War, where it was obvious that, that, that business was going to be really badly hit by it. And they started searching around, thinking, how can we keep this company going, this silk weaving company going? And they lit upon the idea that they would need parachute silk. Um, and he... he, he the, so, so it's about when the company, it's set in the silk mill when they're weaving parachute silk under enormous pressure from the from the, the war office to churn out parachute silk because of course, you know, people were going, planes were going down with parachutes and so on, parachutes are desperately needed. Um, 
And it was a, it was a very tough time, and, and I just thought it was an interesting period to write about. But not only that, but there was a fascinating real life love story at the centre of the last telegram, which is based absolutely on a true story. What happened was my family, um, although not Jewish, had lots of Jewish friends uh, living on the, uh, in Europe, uh, whom they knew, of course, they were all in the rag trade together, if you like. Um, and when they heard what was going on um, with, the, with the Nazi government, they, um, and they, they were desperate to try to do something to help them. And when they heard about the Kinder Transport Scheme, for your listeners who haven't heard about it, it the German government very cynically allowed um, families to send their Jewish children out of the country on payment of a significant whack of money, um, uh, so long as the children were sponsored in that other country. And many kinder transport children came, went to America, but first of all, they arrived in England because they came across the channel. Um, but my family sponsored five kinder transport teenage boys to come over and be uh, subways. Come 1940s, and the Germans are right on our doorstep, and the Americans haven't joined us yet, and we thought we were going to be overrun, spy fever was at its absolute height, and the British government, in its wisdom, decided to intern all enemy aliens, that is, gather them up and basically put them in prison. And what they did, actually, was they sent quite a lot to Canada, but then they also sent a load to Australia. When they discovered how badly these poor internees were treated on the on the ship, they uh, agreed to let them come back uh, on the grounds that they should be they would allow to they, they would fight with the Allies. Basically, they needed more troops. One of these boys who'd been interned and sent to Australia was desperate to get back to Sudbury in England because he'd fallen in love with a girl at the Sudbury post office, and he uh, he came back. He fought with the Allies in Burma in tanks, a terrible, terrible war he had, but he came back alive and he rejoined the company and he was my father's right-hand man. And I knew him as this kind of uncle, uncle with always an extremely strong German accent. I grew up knowing his children, same age as myself, and still know them today. And when I, I went to ask his widow, he died by the time I was writing the book, but I went to ask his widow if she'd mind me using the story, and she said, no, she'd be delighted. So that is the love story at the center of the last telegram. <laughs> And then, so that was your very first book? Yes, it was, yeah. Oh, okay. So, because um, you had started writing later, you said, you know, I looked on your website, it said you started writing later, and now it seems like, you know, like I said, you're writing like a book a year, which is amazing. And um, so what, what do you have next? Like, are you having fun doing it like this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, loving it. I mean, I, I, I sort of don't, I think I'd be a bit lost if I didn't do it, to be honest. Um, I wrote three books for a big publisher called Harper Collins, mm -hmm. um, and then I wanted to write The Silk Weaver. But it, The Silk Weaver, as we've been saying earlier, is set in the 18th century. The first three books were set in the 20th century. They were historical, but they were 20th century. And Harper Collins really didn't want me to write to 18th century. They had me pigeonholed as a 20th century historical writer. But I really wanted to write The Silk Weaver, so I jumped, I, I turned down their offer of a new contract. And actually, I, and that as a consequence, I had a little longer to write The Silk Weaver because I didn't actually have a publisher at the time. But happily, once it was finished, Pam Macmillan picked it up. That's in the UK. Nice. Um, as the, the, the US publisher always has been source books. Um, at, at, right from the start, they've been my publisher. So they, they, have, they, have, they have been faithful to me and me to them. <laughs> That's awesome. So what, what is the next book that you're going to write? Or okay. that you've written? <laughs> Well, the next book that I've written is coming out in the UK in January 2019, and, no, 2018, sorry, I'm uh -huh. confused. So, um, it, it's going back to the 20th century. Pat McMillan said, would I write another book which, like the Poppy Factory, marked the end this time of the First World War? Um, and while I was researching the Poppy Factory, which was time to mark the start of the First World War, the 100th anniversary of the start of the First World War, I read this single sentence which said, to my astonishment, that very soon after the war, a war ended, within months, people were taking tourist trips to the battlefields. Now, I mean, if you, anybody who's ever been to Flanders and, and read about the devastation that was caused in, in, those, in those towns and cities and countryside, the fact that tourists actually traveled there, I mean, the place was just littered with ordnance and, and trenches and mines and bodies. It was... You know, it was completely devastated. 
And I thought, what an interesting place to set a novel. <laughs> and so I set what is, no, what is, what is called, um, coming out next year in the UK, and I hope uh, in the US, it's called in the UK, In Love and War. And it's about three women who meet in Flanders shortly after the war ended. And they're all three of them looking for traces of their loved ones. Because for both the Germans and the Americans and the English, and those are the three characters, um, only one in four were never, their bodies were never found. Now, anybody who's ever been bereaved will know that not being able to find a body is almost, you know, it's desperately painful. Yes. And so that's why people traveled to Flanders in a kind of desperate search for some kind of sign of what might have happened to their loved ones. So that's the next one. But you'll be interested to know that right now I'm writing the one after that. I'm halfway through. Um, and it's called Miss Charlotte. Now, you might remember Miss Charlotte from The Hidden Thread. Yes. And I when, I, when, I wrote, when, when I submitted it to my agent, The Hidden Thread, she said, I really like Miss Charlotte's character. <laughs> I, do t I did too. I really liked her character. Because she's, she's so, um, you know, she's a woman in, in business on her own account. Right. In 18th century London, which basically, you know, pretty much wasn't ha didn't happen. And she's interesting, too, because in The Hidden Thread, as you know, she's a go-between. You know, I, I, I figured out slightly, you know, I, I was already partway into the book when I figured out that Thomas Hardy had it right. Basically, for two people from different social levels to meet, there had to be a go-between. Right. And so Miss Charlotte, Miss Charlotte was my go-between. But she's also interested, interesting because... She moves quite fluidly between what were then really rather rigid class class structures. Um, she, she, she's she's an artisan, but she works very closely with duchesses and you know uh, um, not quite the royal family, but you know people of high status. And so she 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 um, I think she's interesting because she's independent, she's unmarried, she runs her own business uh, in in that time when women didn't. Rather like Anna Maria Garthwaite. Uh, she runs her own business and is very successful at it. That's amazing, especially for, I have to tell you that it's so weird because my grandmother had her own business as a seamstress. She mm -hmm. traveled the world um, with very wealthy people and would buy fabrics and then fit them and make their, make their dresses. And, you know, she did have a very hard time because she was raised in a very modest very modest, if not poverty, poverty level at some time, and then to be dealing with very extremely wealthy people. So it's very interesting because that's why when you said, did you like, you know, know her character, I felt like her character, and my grandmother was doing it in the 60s, in the 1960s, and this character was doing it 100 years before. So I, I love that. Love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I really related to that character. So I, I can't wait to read that book. And Liz, it has been so awesome talking to you. Everybody, like I said before, I'm going to put her link to her Amazon page. You will be able to get to her books. Um, the Hidden Thread is also called The Silk Weaver, but I, but I think you can find it as The Hidden Thread on Amazon. So um, I, I, it's just, I knew right away that I was going to love your writing, and I am so happy that I read The Hidden Thread. <laughs> You might, you, might, um, you might also enjoy The Forgotten Seamstress, because that's about a seamstress yes. who, who yes. starts, starts her life working in Buckingham Palace. So, I mean, that might be of interest, too. Oh, definitely. I, I plan on reading them all, Liz. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Just, Great. just so you know, I, I, I loved it. It was an amazing story, and I love the way you write. So, um, best of luck to you with your next books, and I can't wait for them to come out. Thank you. And you will send me the link, will you, to, to this interview? I absolutely will. And we'll get make sure that all your links are correct so everybody can find you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. Have a great day. Lovely to talk to you. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.